And thank you also for this uh, uh, opportunity to speak at this important event. And we're talking here about some, uh, we're going to speak here about the subject, which really is something that dominates the whole world as we know it today. But it wasn't always like that. When Marx uh, wrote his most important works uh, in the mid uh, 1800s, capitalism was still playing a progressive role. Under a system of free competition, industry was being developed at a never before seen pace. In this period, the basis of our modern industry was laid. It was a period of free trade in the sense that producers from all over the world were able to compete on a uh, free market, on an open market, on a comparatively equal footing. Lenin pointed out how Marx didn't just describe this period of free competition, but he also explained how this period inevitably would lead to another period. Lenin wrote the following. Half a century ago, when Marx was writing Capital, free competition appeared to the overwhelming majority of economists to be a natural law. Official science tried, by a conspiracy of silence, to kill the works of Marx, who, by a theoretical and historical analysis of capitalism, had proved that free competition gives rise to the concentration of production, which in turn, at a certain stage of development, leads to monopoly. And Lenin wrote this in Imperialism, the Highest Stage of Capitalism. It brings to mind the constant sermons that have been delivered over the past few decades about the wonders of free market and competition, in sp spite of all the evidence to the contrary. In the se session on the labor theory of value, comrades explained how modern bourgeois how modern economic science has become completely mystical and can't explain anything. So just like they deny the labor theory of value, when it comes to the question of monopoly, the economists refuse to draw the obvious conclusion that competition inevitably leads to monopoly. In imperialism, Lenin showed the facts and figures precisely how this process had taken place. He pointed out, for example, how 1% of the companies in the United States by 1909 were producing 50% of all commodities. And today this process has gone a lot further. Today we have 13 monopolies that control almost the entire car industry. We got BMW, Daimler, Stellantis, which is Fiat, Chrysler, o Opel and Vauxhall, Ford, Geely, General Motors, Honda, Hyundai, Kia, Nissan, Renault, Tata Motors, Toyota and Volkswagen. Uh, Tesla is emerging as one of the major car brands outside of this traditional group of monopolies. But this uh, one newcomer will only prepare the way for further monopolization. Uh, because with the development of electric cars, this technology requires even more research uh, and capital investment than the previous technologies. So this will further increase monopolization in the car market. In the US mass media market, in 1983, 50 companies controlled 90% of the market. By 2011, six companies controlled 90% of the market. That's uh, General Electric, News Corp, Disney, Viacom, Time Warner, and CBS. Um, since 2011, you have another, a couple of new companies that have entered the scene, in particular Netflix and Amazon. But rather than opening up the market for free competition and the new, new era of free competition, the entry of Netflix and Amazon has merely meant that all the previous monopolies have consolidated and merged even further. In the electronics industry, with its requirement of vast capital expenditure, the world market is also completely monopolized. In the market for microprocessors, and there are lots of different kinds of microprocessors, but nevertheless, eight companies control 60% of the world market. When it comes to memory modules for phones and computers and so on, Samsung alone produces 45% of all memory modules. Five companies, Samsung, Apple, Huawei, Xiaomi, and Oppo, they control 67% of the mobile phone market in the United States. And on the world scale, uh, it isn't all that different. The smallest semiconductors measure around four nanometers 
And the most modern microprocessors need to have those tiny, tiny uh, parts in order to work. And 92% of those are supplied by one company called Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company. And the rest is the remaining 8% are produced by Samsung. In the wider market, including also the slightly biggest, bigger semiconductors, TSMC, which is this, this Taiwan company, uh, supplies 56% of semiconductors. And it's not really hard to see why they can have such a dominant position. A single factory or foundry can cost as much as $20 billion to build. One key manufacturing tool for, uh, that is needed in this process, uh, one of these machines can cost $100 million each. And these machines, which can produce these four nanometer uh, semiconductors, there's only one company in the world that produced them, and it's the Dutch company ASML, which also controls 60% 60, uh, 60 of the globe broader market for these kind of uh, machines, also for the bigger components. The sums required to stay competitive in this market are immense. TSMC, in spite of its monopoly position, still are planning to spend $100 billion over the next three years in order on capital expenditure as well as uh, research and development. Now, this completely bars the way for new entrants into this industry, except, of course, with massive state aid, which is taking place now in the United States. I think the latest bill uh, for this purpose is $230 billion the US is planning to spend and trying to develop its own industry. And Elenin explained this, the tendency towards monopoly arises from the huge size of the enterprises. This transformation of competition into monopoly is one of the most important, if not the most important phenomena of modern capitalist economy. But we shouldn't imagine that just because you establish a monopoly at one time, it will remain so forever or that such a situation where you have like a kind of ultra monopoly will introduce a period of stability. That would be a completely one-sided way of looking at it. Marx explained is in the poverty of philosophy. He said, in practical life, we find not only competition monopoly and the antagonism between them, but also the synthesis of the two, which is not a formula, but a movement. Monopoly produces competition. Competition produces monopoly. Monopolists are made from competition, competitors become monopolists. What we observe here is a continuous process that's taking place, but what we will not see is a reverse of the way that capitalism used to function 150 years ago. We're not going to, have to see a resurrection in spite of the libertarians' wet dreams of, uh, free, of free competition. The question of imperialism isn't directly relevant to the topic we're discussing here, but it's also, I think I will. I think it's not nevertheless important to mention because it's so intimately linked to the question of monopoly. Uh, in this uh, same passage, Marx explains that development of monopoly only sharpens existing contradictions in capitalism. If the monopolists restrict their mutual competition by means of partial associations, competition increases among the workers, and the more the mass of the proletarians grow again, as against the monopolists of one nation, the more desperate competition becomes between the monopolists of different nations. The synthesis is of such a character that monopoly can only maintain itself by continually enter into the struggle of competition. So here you have already Marxists sketching out the theme that Lenin was to pick up in uh, his book, Imperialism, uh, where he said that domination and the violence associated with it, such are the relationships that are typical of the latest phase of capitalist development. That is what inevitably had to result and has resulted from the formation of all powerful economic monopolies. Another key part of how the world functions today is finance capital. Again, Marx uh, explained some of this in his writings, but during his lifetime, we didn't, we, he didn't see it in its full development. Lenin did, however. He wrote, the concentration of production, the monopolies arising therefrom, the merging or coalescence of the banks of industry, such is the history of the rise of finance capital, and such is the content of that concept. As industries mature and monopolies dominate a particular branch of industries, 
super profits are made and surplus capital is created that cannot be profitably reinvested into that same branch of industry. So the surplus profits is then deposited into banks, which can then redistribute this surplus capital into other less, uh, more profitable industries, as less, less developed, less mature industries, where there's more scope for investment. The banks become the conduit of surplus capital between different branches of industry. Credit seeks to equalize the rate of profit by moving money into the most profitable sectors. And the concentration of uh, capital that occurs in the industry also is mirrored in the banking sector. As long gone are the days when you had, when a bank consisted of one office in, in a town. And instead we now have multinational uh, corporations that span across the whole world with thousands or tens of thousands of branches. All the small local banks were taken over or put out of business. Now this whole, this ha happened in tandem with the monopolization of industry, but this also coincided with a different, uh, with a, uh, a separate development. Those who dreamed that capital, capitalism would become more benign the older it got, they call this process the democratization of capital. Instead of having just one owner, parts of industry are now developed to such a degree that uh, one individual capitalist or even a family was no longer sufficient in order to run a company. And the system of shareholding was a way of spreading ownership across a number of different capitalists. And in this way, they were, tempor they were able partially to overcome the limitations that, that private ownership placed on the devel further development of industry. Again, Lenin explained, a finance capital concentrated in a few hands and exercising a virtual monopoly, exacts enormous and ever-increasing profits from the floating of companies, the issue of stock, state loans, etc., strengthens the domination of the financial oligarchy and levies tribute upon the whole of society for the benefit of monopolists. So this democratization of ownership, the spreading of ownership, far from creating uh, a more... Uh, benign capitalism just uh, strengthen the control of financial capital. At present, the financial assets of the financial companies in the world were, uh, were a total of $510 billion. I think this is wrong, <laughs> apologies. I think it's meant to be trillion dollars. And this was is actually equal to the um, non-financial assets in the world economy which again, they value to $520 trillion. A lot of these real assets are fictitious in their valuation, but it shows the tremendous power that financial corporations have over the real, uh, over the economy. Non-financial institutions also ha have large claims. Lots of workers have money and pension schemes and so on, but there is a vast difference there. Having some money saved in a pension fund gives you zero influence over how the company is run. No influence over how investments are made with your money. You get no influence how those companies that are invested in are run uh, or how those votes are cast. And the same goes for lots of other types of investment companies like hedge funds and so on. So Lenin said the democratization of capital is, in fact, one of the ways of increasing the power of the financial oligarchy. So uh, this didn't actually end, uh, this spreading of ownership actually just strengthened domination of finance capital rather than the other way around. It gave monopoly capital even more po uh, power to dominate the smaller entities. In practice, if holding a small minority of shares in the company was sufficient to be able to dom control the whole company, provided of course that there were no other big shareholders that had a bigger stake than yourself. So the consequence is that the, big share, uh, the bigger shareholders could, con could control not just their own capital, but also the capital of their peers, the smaller peers. And the Lenin quotes Siemens, the German industrialist, who remarked in 1900 that the one pound share is the basis of British imperialism. Uh, many mergers and takeovers take place by issuing new shares which means that the bigger monopolists could uh, over time accumulate even greater resources whilst, even whilst diluting their ownership. 
the shareholders of the smaller companies that are being absorbed into a bigger whole, their share will be too small to have any influence over the running of the company. And in this way, big capital expropriates the small and medium capital. In certain countries, this was even uh, institutionalized in a, a system where different types of shares have different voting rights, thus even more consolidating uh, the control of, of the company in the hands of the big shareholders. And in this whole process, the banks became the gatekeepers. They supply loans, uh, they arrange the issue of shares and so on. And Lenin says, all these reorganizations and reconstructions have a twofold significance for the banks. First, as profitable transactions, and secondly, as opportunities for securing control of the companies in difficulties. The expansion of credit drives the expansion of banking and the monopolization of the banking sector. And of course, having a loan is fine, as long as you have the means of paying it back. But the moment you can no longer pay back your loan or struggling to make the payments, then the vultures start circling. And this, um, obviously, these vultures are the banks, the hedge funds, and so on. This finance capital who steps in and try to uh, take a cut, take a share of the company. So the expansion of credit also means the expansion of the power of these institutions. And over the past few decades, we've seen a tripling of debts as a proportion of GDP in the advanced capitalist countries. And who is who are the ones that issue the bonds? Who, uh, who buys the bond, sorry, and, and issues the debt, the banks and other financial institutions. And the collateral for this is a house in the case of mortgages or a share in the company. It's another typical collateral for corporate debt. So the banks hold the world economy in their hands. And they're also one of the first parties that get a piece of the pie when a company enters into liquidation. And of course, in this process, the small and medium sized companies are far more likely to succumb to the uh, difficulties than the bigger ones. And so gradually the banks, uh, financial institutions grab a larger and larger share, not just of debt, but also of ownership of companies. On the board of many companies now sits the representatives of financial institutions, the board of directors of Tesla, for example, uh, have on it two partners of venture capitalist com companies, one former chief investment officer of Japan's government pension fund, the son of Rupert Murdoch, who also owns a private investment company. Walmart has on its board a representative of Morgan Stanley, and three other uh, investment firms are also on its board, including the chairman of the board is from an investment company. On Amazon's board of directors, we find someone from Bridgewater Associates and one from Goldman Sachs. And Amazon's ownership is also quite interesting to look at. And now Jeff Bezos is the famous guy, he's the biggest shareholder in Amazon. He owns 10% of the company. But uh, also the advisors group, the Grand Vanguard group, and BlackRock all own between 5 and 8% each. These are all various types of hedge funds or investment companies. They have lots of different names, but yeah. In total, what they call institutional investors hold 59% of the shares in Amazon. I also looked into, I read an article about the oil industry and the financial capital in the oil industry. And it's well known that they involve themselves in insuring the shipments and also in speculating on the price of oil but a large number of them also have stakes in a very large number of oil companies, even to the point where uh, I, it's a list of about eight or so investment companies. And each of them had a list of about 20 or 30 companies that they owned uh, privately, which means that they are no longer publicly listed, they're privately owned by the bank. So there are no other shareholders in those, bank, in those uh, companies. And this is everything from oil prospecting to oil maintenance. And then to the, in the big oil companies, they only have shares like 6% shares or something like that in the big oil companies. So today to separate industrial capital from finance capital is practically impossible. They're one and the same. And this is uh, of crucial importance. Um, both Lenin and Marx pointed out that this changed how capitalism functions. 
Then you said that scattered capitalists are transformed into a single collective capitalist. Consider companies like Berkshire Hathaway, which is run by a particular quite famous banker. He, uh, well, he runs the company, he not, doesn't own it. Um, but he's built this company since the 1970s, I think. It's one of the largest investment companies in the world. And it owns what you call controlling shares in a number of companies which means its share of ownership is so big that no one can really else has an influence over the company. Its total assets are worth something like $1 trillion. So that's um, what it's like. Yeah, so it's like uh, one five hundredth of the entire wealth of the world is owned by this one company. The companies they own produce energy, motorhomes, cut limestones, carpets, furniture, jewelry, ice cream, electric cables, among other things. They also sell insurance, pilot training, cars, and logistic services. And those were the companies that they control. But they also have significant investments, uh, smaller investments in American Express, Apple, Coca-Cola, and Wells Fargo. And what's the common denominator between these companies? Well, there is none. BlackRock is an asset management company. It manages $10 trillion worth of assets. That's 2% of the world's total wealth. Um, now, it's a bit different, like, so whereas Berkshire Hathaway, you invest your money in shares in the company, and the company is, then owns uh, lots of different other companies. BlackRock works a bit differently. BlackRock doesn't actually own the assets that it manages. It's, it's merely, uh, we say, it's only funds that you invest in, and these funds then uh, buy certain, uh, buy assets and so on. But uh, BlackRock doesn't formally own these assets. But nonetheless, it controls and casts votes uh, at uh, the important meetings of these companies that they invest in. This is now how the world is run. And what we can see here is, is that for these companies, uh, profit now appears merely as an interest. It doesn't matter which industry they're investing uh, in, what matters is the returns. The capitalists who invest their money in BlackRock or in Berkshire Hathaway are not involved in production at all. They have professional managers who run these investment companies, and then these professional managers in turn appoint other professional managers to run the companies that actually produce things. So it doesn't matter whether they sell cars, they produce cars, or they sell insurance, it's, it's, it, as long as it gives a return on the investment. So with this change into joint stock companies, shareholding companies, and even more so with hedge funds, investment companies, pensions funds, and so on, property becomes social property rather than private property, as Marx puts it. But it's, so, it's social property within the confines of the capitalist system. He says there's social property appropriated by the few. Um, but this obviously does, it doesn't mean that we're arrived in socialism or anything of the kind. As uh, Lenin says, the distribution of means of production is not at all universal, but private, i.e. it conforms to the interests of big capital and primarily of huge monopoly capital. My, Marx calls it private pr production unchecked by private ownership. Far from resolving the problems of capitalism, it only intensifies them. Then he describes how they intensify the anarchy inherent in capitalist production as a whole. Marx explains how the massive expansion of credit, joint stock companies, etc., accelerates the development of the productive forces worldwide and the world market, but at the same time, it provokes more violent outbursts of crisis. And that's precisely what we've seen today a massive expansion of credit and uh, a massive, massive acceleration of monopolization and concentration of ownership into tiny hands full of people. And then the massive crisis that burst to the surface. But what does this development signify, according to Marx? He says they develop exploitation of labor into its purest form, but also that this constitutes a form of transition to a new mode of production. For Marx and Lenin, the development of monopoly capitalism and with it imperialism was a necessary point of transition from capitalism to socialism. Capitalism has created social property and social production. And by social production, I mean the interconnectedness of supply chains of factories all over the world. The capitalists have no longer 
no longer play any role in production and have become completely parasitic. What we're describing here is that the means of production have outgrown the mode of production. Within capitalism, the new society has already grown and developed, of course, in a completely distorted manner. We have social property with private ownership. We have social production, but in private hands. And this is why the productive forces are revolting against the confines placed upon them by capitalism. And the tremendous impasse that the world finds itself in today is precisely because of this uh, contradiction or this revolt or this uprising by the productive forces. Capitalism has very neatly prepared a way for the expropriation of uh, the capitalist class. Free competition created monopolies in production and democratic, in inverted commas, share ownership has created a monopoly on ownership. Credit has concentrated the world, the running of the world, the control of the world economy in the hands of a tiny handful of multinational corporations. Forbes uh, publishes a, a list of the top 500 to 1,000 monopolies in the world. And maybe we should consider it a bit of a hit list. At least we can tick off for the expropriation uh, once we've taken power. Because it would be sufficient to take over these companies and we will have the world uh, economy under our control. Maybe we wouldn't even have to do all of those. The immense power of assets managers like BlackRock retailers like Amazon or Walmart, or energy companies like Exxon or Total, uh, would mean that you could plan the, uh, the world economy without necessarily having to own every single company. But it's not just in uh, questions of ownership where the uh, potential for socialism has developed tremendously over the last few decades, or um, the size of the working class with develops in tandem with the development of productive forces. As Mark says, uh, capitalism produces its own grave diggers, but also the technology that's developed by some of these corporations uh, have massively uh, prepared, simplified the future administration of a planned economy. These companies have created uh, computer software and automated systems that are quite capable of uh, running very complicated, very large chains of logistics without, with minimal human intervention. Walmart was one of the pioneers of what they called push supply chains, uh, which means that rather than letting each manager decide in the store, decide what the shop is to stock, they are told, the, these stores are told, sen, told by management centrally what they are to put in their shops. This is because they can use computer systems and in a very precise, in a very sophisticated way, can predict what people will be buying in this particular store at a particular point in time. And uh, information is collected straight from the cash registers in the case of Walmart, which are then connected up to a huge database, which then passes on the information to Walmart suppliers who can then adopt their production schedules in order to fit what is being bought in Walmart's cash registers. There's little room for human intervention or for the market to play a role in all this. In fact, here we have a centralized plan of production for one company. Amazon uh, followed in Walmart's footsteps a few years ago. They fired all the warehouse purchasing managers and instead they allowed computer algorithms to dictate uh, purchases and uh, logistics. Here they could go even further than Walmart had done because Amazon can track not just what you buy, but also what you don't buy. It's like wearing a tracker when you're walking through the aisles of a physical shop. Try, Amazon will track you all the way through from the moment you open their website, all the way through to you make a purchase or don't make a purchase, but also to track you on what you do on lots of other websites and collect information in cases relevant for what they need. So with this data then, they like just like Mark Walmart, they placed their employees with their suppliers to ensure that systems were set up so that this data, which uh, the data that these suppliers required were communicated as effectively as possible to the companies to ensure there was a, stream, a steady stream of goods flowing into the warehouses or rather to the customers with minimum stock in the warehouses. And here also we have a situation where actually in a lot of cases, you now have these retailers basically dominating the 
the whole of, uh, increase in parts of the supply chain by actually kind of having their agents in these come in their in the companies that supply them. Uh, many of these, uh, many of Amazon suppliers only sell on Amazon, and so Amazon can uh, completely dictate terms to them. But to accomplish this, they had to develop huge processing power to process all the data that they were accumulating, which gave rise to the most profitable part of their business, which is cloud computing. And this is a system which links together uh, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of computers in different parts of the world to function just as if they were one computer and thereby minimizing the wasted capacity. And this accumulated computing power now makes things possible that would never have been possible in the past. And uh, cloud computing makes uh, the running of uh, all these computer systems more resilient, cheaper, and less dependent on geography. In fact, here we have another example of socialized production, where means of production uh, computers are shared between many different multinational companies by using the same computers. Most banks now run their, uh, their uh, big computer systems on uh, different cloud servers like Amazon or Google and so on. And nationalizing these cloud operators would be another key part of uh, uh, key link in the chain of production. Um, but all this data they collect could surely be used to plan production, to develop strategies for managing logistics, plan for changes in, product, in consumption. All this information is available, but obviously we would put it to the good of society rather than to the good of the advertisers. And uh, in, in fact, these big monopolies, as I mentioned, are already using the data that they collect in this manner. It is often implied that the success of Amazon is down to their ill treatment of workers, but that's getting things the wrong way around. The way they treat the workers is in order to fit them into the machinery, it's to fit them into the tremendous pressure that's created by uh, just-in-time production and computer algorithms. The workers are being treated like flexible machines, attempting to deprive them of all their humanity to make them fit into a logistics chain to make them function like robots. And now, of course, Amazon is taking the next logical step in this process, and they're replacing many of the workers with machinery. Amazon still says they're still hiring lots of people in various parts of the world, but Amazon has 1.6 million workers, and it has half a million robots. But the number of robots is, is increasing as a much faster rate than the number of employees. And by linking up these robots to Amazon's powerful computer systems, they provide a formidable army that can keep Amazon's logistics chain moving. When used for private profit, uh, the Amazon's resources only create misery for the workers. But on the other hand, this development of robotics provide another important stepping stone in liberating humanity from the drudgery of manual labor. Other technological developments are open up even more possibilities. New materials are revolutionizing uh, technology. And you have technologies like 3D printing, who almost becomes a bit like a, star, a replicator in Star Trek. All of this has uh, tremendous potential, but it's not being used. There's a lot of talk about uh, all the future of automation. At least there was a lot of talk about it a couple of years ago. But there's a lot of talk and not very much investment. In many cases, it remains cheaper for the capitalists to employ workers than to buy machines. There is also excess capacity in many sectors, meaning there is no uh, appetite for the capitalists to invest. Or if one is to be more accurate, there is no appetite for the managers that are hired by the capitalists to invest. On the basis of capitalism, another leap forward in the productive forces is ruled out. And these technological developments that, have, that are coming remain merely potential. In class society, expropriations are a dirty word. Uh, but the truth, as we have seen, is that a tiny layer in our society has expropriated the property of the rest. The small businessmen, the medium-sized businessmen, even the, some of the larger businesses have all been placed under the domination of the big multinational corporations. The workers, of course, have not had their property expropriated, but the products of their labor are being expropriated on a daily basis. 
uh, the worker's role in production is being broken down into its smallest parts, screwing in the same door on the same model car over and over again, or flipping burgers over and over again in the same monotonous motion. Human beings are really the most versatile, most capable animal that the universe has ever produced, as far as we know, at least. But these human beings are being reduced to producing the main, mo most monotonous tasks over and over again. Uh, capitalist production has created the most tremendous waste, a tremendous waste of human talent and ingenuity. At the same time, workers have to submit to daily indignities of managers who don't understand anything about the job, but still pretend that they know everything. Engineers and consultants who haven't done a manual day of work in their entire life. Even white collar workers are finding their jobs de-skilled and reduced to their component parts. Even lawyers face competition from computers with automatic writing of wills and things like that. Doctors are having their working conditions eroded. Teachers are having every single moment of their lessons controlled and monitored. The number of managers are exploding and creating an ever increasing load of administration from, uh, for the frontline workers. Management practices, cuts and privatization has made it impossible for many public sector workers to carry out their jobs and it's causing widespread demoralization. Socialism will put human beings again in charge of our own creations, planning aided by vast developments in computer technology will enable us to take uh, control of production out of the hands of the anarchy of the market and put the workers back in charge. Rather than being a mere appendage of the machine, the worker would become the master of the machine. That, this is our proposition. Workers control means that conscious human decision-making will determine the direction of society. The organization of socialist production will be very different. We're going to turn production on its head, or maybe the right way up. Production chains are already social. They use vast arrays of components from all across the world, involving thousands of different companies, and uh, which in turn employ hundreds of thousands of workers. This provides the basis of a truly international planned production on a level that we've never seen before. It's also the final nail in the coffin for the reactionary utopia of socialism in one country. Production now is truly global and supply chains are in open revolt against the nation state. It's obvious that capitalism with the rise of protectionism is in full reverse rather than moving forward. And humanity here has a choice. Socialism with its promise of superabundance or the barbarism that capitalism has to offer. For us communists, we can see that the only way forward is to liberate the productive forces from both the nation state and from private ownership. Capitalism has created the preconditions for socialism. What we now have to do is to realize it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Nicholas. Well, comrades, I think we can all agree that was uh, very interesting and an effective defense of the need for socialist planning. As Nicholas explained, it's not just highly realistic, but the next necessary step forward for humanity. So I'm looking forward to this uh, discussion, where well, the first contribution will be from, uh, from comrade uh, Francesco Marilli, who is from the International Secretariat of the IMT in London. Um, well, what we're focusing on here is the immense potential brought about by the development of capitalism in terms of uh, knowledge, science, technique, methods of production and organization. These productive forces will provide the material basis for socialism once uh, the straitjacket of private property of the means of production and the national state are removed. And this is true today, uh, even uh, uh, as we are in a capitalism senile age, uh, which is riddled with crisis. We also see how the means of production and capital are being concentrated in the hands of uh, very few monopolies and finance capital. To an extent that uh, uh, even uh, Marx and Lenin in, ge in their geniality could not predict. As we know, all these means today are used by capitalism to maximize the appropriation of the value created by the working class, uh, that is to maximize profit. We can say today, uh, we can say uh, that innovation under capitalism is increasing the exploitation of the working class. 
However, it also creates the material conditions for of socialized production and distribution, that is the material preconditions for socialism. But how do we go from capitalism to socialism? Capitalism will not get out of the way uh, on its own accord. It will stagger as a dying corpse, poisoning the lives of all of us until it's flushed away by revolutionary means. Only through the revolutionary overthrow of capitalism, we will be able to fully take control of these resources and put them at the service of uh, true human development. In order to achieve that, there needs to be a conscious act uh, that is the socialist revolution. Uh, this means the overthrow of the capitalist system and the oppressive machines decide to secure the domination of uh, the minority over a vast majority under the conditions of class society. Uh, that means the capitalist state. All this has to happen on an international scale. Uh, I cannot deal here with the questions of revolutionary strategy and tactics and the need for the revolutionary party. We will be discussing this in other sessions. All the historical experience shows the burning need for that contradictions to be resolved. However, the workers themselves in normal circumstances are not aware of their power to run society. In my intervention, I will raise the question of how the working class can prepare to take control over society and run it, starting from the present level of the productive forces. The working class is capable of carrying out their tasks in capitalist society and without their kind permission, to put it with the words of Ted Grant, not a wheel turns, not a light shines. However, this power becomes apparent only when exercised collectively as a class. The consciousness of this power develops as the workers enter into collective struggle. The crisis of capitalism is what forces the working class throughout the world to mobilize in defense of their conditions. These convulsions are reaching revolutionary proportions in one country after another, as we speak. The demand for workers' control over production is a powerful demand that should be raised in conditions when the workers are questioning the power of the capitalists within the factory or workplace. The pandemic, for example, posed in a sharp way the need for workers' control over safety measures and working conditions, while the capitalists were pushing for business as usual. Workers' control of production means access to the accounts, contracts, financial flows, and every other aspect of the functioning of a capitalist company. Uh, it means questioning the right of the capitalists to hire and sack workers or introduce any change in the working conditions, rhythm of production, etc. It can prepare the grounds for the demand to expropriate the company by nationalizing it and posing it under workers' control and management. Uh, this process uh, is just one step away from questioning the power of the capitalists upon society as a whole. Factory closures, mass sackings, or any uh, of the ways that the crisis of capitalism is expressing itself will create the conditions, or is creating the conditions for this demand to become central in the class struggle. Uh, it is a tool to raise the confidence of the working class in its own power. However, uh, workers' control has to be understood as a transitional demand in the sense uh, that it reflects the rising class struggle and revolutionary consciousness. Uh, it introduces a regime of dual power in the factory or in the workplace. Uh, we should not have a romantic approach uh, because it undermines the control by the capitalists. Workers' control cannot be considered as a permanent conquest of uh, any struggle. Capitalists can rely on the support of the trade union bureaucracy and the state to restore their control. Um, Trotsky highlighted the contradiction posed by workers' control in a situation where ownership and what it legally entails remains in the hands of the capitalists. In 1931, uh, writing about uh, the situation in Germany, he wrote, the workers need control not for platonic purposes, but in order to exert practical influence upon the production and commercial operations of the employers. Uh, this cannot, however, be attained unless the control is transformed into direct management. In a developed form, workers' control uh, thus implies a sort of econ economic dual power in the factory, the bank, commercial enterprises, and so, and so forth. Um, this is very different from what uh, is being presented by uh, the trade union bureaucracies or the capitalists uh, as workers' participation co-determination, different variants of social partnership introduced uh, by the capitalists as a means to involve uh, in class collaboration, the trade union bureaucracy and corrupt the layer uh, of the uh, aristocracy of, of labor at the expenses of the mass of the workers. And Trotsky warned about this. 
If the participation of the workers in the management of production is to be lasting, stable, normal, it must rest upon class collaboration and not upon class struggle. Such a class collaboration can be realized only through the upper strata of the trade unions and the capitalist associations. Um, the, the revolutionary approach to workers' control is the opposite. What we want is to educate the working class to exercise dual power inside capitalist companies in connection with the situation leading to a revolutionary upheaval. Uh, again, Trotsky uh, continues saying, after taking the path of control of production, the proletariat will inevitably press forward in the direction of the seizure of power and of the means of production. Uh, workers' control uh, in the present conditions and uh, in, in the run up to the revolutionary transformation of society, to the socialist revolution, poses the question of workers' management, but it cannot answer it until capitalism is overthrown. After capitalism is overthrown, Work, workers' control has to be generalized during the transition uh, as a way to train the working class towards workers' management and take over from the capitalist the running of the economy. If we compare the tasks facing us to the conditions faced by the Bolsheviks after the Russian Revolution, this task is immensely facilitated today by the important development of the productive forces, the level of widespread education, literacy, and access to culture by the working class. And yes, also by the concentration of capitalist production into monopoly capitalism today. Uh, we should look at the revolutionary future of mankind with confidence. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Francesco, for uh, that intervention. Uh, our first uh, speaker will be uh, Franco Bavilla from uh, the Italian section of the IMT. One of the symptoms of uh, capitalism sickness is a uh, labor shortage. Many companies complain that uh, they can find uh, enough employees. All economic sectors are affected. Tourism, agriculture, retail, construction, airlines, manufacturing, uh, software development, microchips, logistics. This is an international problem affecting many countries. In Hungary, there are 80,000 job vacancies. In Switzerland, more than uh, 100,000 job vacancies. Australia, 423,000. Germany, 558,000. In Canada, more than 900,000. Malaysia, 1.2 million job vacancies. Great Britain, 1.3 million. Along with other factors, labor shortage undermine the possibilities of an economic recovery after the pandemic. But what are the causes of the labor shortage? The shock of the pandemic clearly had a huge impact on the consciousness of many workers who reevaluated their lives and jobs. But the shock of the pandemic only exacerbated the process that already existed before. Bourgeois commentators blame the unemployment benefits granted by the state during the pandemic, or they accuse uh, young people of no longer having the same work ethic as previous generations. However, the real causes are different. The first is the general decline of working condition in last decades with uh, lower wages, longer hours, precarious work, high level of exploitation and stress. There is also a more general and deep cause for the labor shortage, a cause related to how the capitalism system itself works to its internal contradictions. In all countries, labor shortage coexists with unemployment. Experts speak of a mismatch between labor supply and demand. The phenomenon was not entirely unknown in Marx's time. For instance, in Capital, Marx describes how in London in the second half of 1866, between 80 and 90,000 workers had been dismissed, while at the same time, several industrial machineries were forced to lay idle for lack of labor. Marx ascribes the cause of this contradiction to the division of labor. I quote from Capital, it's a glaring contradiction that there is a complaint of want of ends, while at the same time, many thousands are out of work because the division of labor chains them to a particular branch of industry. By division of labor, Marx means the process of fragmentation, diversification, and specialization of productive activities, which reduces the individual worker to a cog in a wheel entirely dominated by the capitalist and limits his technical skills exclusively to a partial and particular task he performs. 
This is why a skilled worker in a specific branch of production can easily perform another task with equally specific but completely different characteristics. According to Marx, under the division of labor, workers become little more than a living accessory to machineries they use. And as you know, one part of a machine doesn't work on another. This cue gives us a useful key to understand what is happening today. In the vast majority of cases, what is lacking is not generic workforce, but skilled workforce, workers with particular technical skills and experiences. And why are there not enough skilled workers? Because capitalists have drastically reduced investment in workers' education in the last decades. First of all, by cuts in public spending for public school and public university. But the bourgeoisie also reduced the investments in training programs directly financed and managed by companies. It's therefore quite clear that on the one hand, massive investment will be needed to educate and retrain tens of millions of workers around the world in order to obtain the skilled labor needed for production needs in the various economic industries. But on the other hand, the capitalists have no intention of making these investments. So we can see once more the increasing parasitic character of the bourgeoisie. The phenomenon of labor shortage may present itself in a more or less acute form in the coming period, depending on the general economic trend, but it can never disappear completely under capitalism because it originates from the contradiction of the capitalism system itself. Instead, to solve the problem at its root, we require a high level of economic planning capable of rationally managing all available economic resources, starting with human resources, this level of planning will never be possible under capitalism, an anarchic, chaotic, and unbalanced system in which each capitalist acts on his own, on the narrow basis of his immediate economic interest, regardless of the long-term consequences. It would be totally different if the means of production were expropriated, nationalized, and subjected to workers' control. At that point, all the resources diverted to secure the capitalist profits could be used for adequate wages, decent working condition and hours compatible with the demands of life so that work can really become a form of personal fulfillment, no longer an alienating form of exploitation from which to try to escape at the first opportunity. Resources diverted unproductively on rent and speculation could be put to use among other things for the education and retraining of the workforce, which will be oriented according to the economic priorities democratically set by the working class. Finally, in the more advanced context of a socialist planning system, the odious capitalist division of labor could be left behind and human beings would be able to take a big step forward in their evolution. No longer a kind of automaton chained to the task of a narrow professional segment without any control or understanding of the overall production process, but well-rounded people with vast technical and cultural knowledge capable of versatile roles in society and finally masters of their own destiny. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Franco, for that uh, highly relevant uh, contribution to the discussion. Now, uh, to understand uh, Marxism, you need to study Marxism. Uh, I have uh, here uh, the Swedish language edition uh, of uh, the theoretical magazine of the IMT, which is called uh, In Defense of Marxism. And it's translated uh, not just uh, into Swedish, but into German, Russian, and uh, into Spanish as America Socialista. Uh, the latest uh, issue was uh, recently uh, published in English uh, with an extremely interesting uh, article on the Civil War, uh, America's Second Revolution. Uh, I recommend everyone to visit marxist.com as forward slash magazine. And uh, I will introduce the next speaker, Comrade uh, Lucas F. from uh, Austria. The climate crisis is one of the biggest threats to the survival of mankind. The worldwide production, which has been built on fossil fuels over hundreds of years, needs to be completely transformed within a few decades. Bourgeois think tanks like the International Energy Association actually published rather detailed plans on how to achieve this. For example, in net zero by 2050, they sketch what amount of investment needs to be taken on what technology, when and how. It is a real rational worldwide plan, so to speak, that they uh, proposed. <laughs> but there are two problems. As you know, capitalists only invest for profit. 
So while big oil companies with their vast research departments and highly advanced technology could play an important role in saving the climate, after all, they themselves uh, were one of the earliest uh, that predicted global warming, for example, Shell. However, as The Guardian recently showed, they are investing heavily in crude oil production to an extent that even the most meager climate goals of the Paris Climate Agreement will be shattered. In this article, The Guardian then proceeds to call on the bourgeois state and the governments to do something. But we have to ask, who invades a country for democracy when a local African government doesn't want to strike a deal with a big oil company? Who defends the oil fields of the big company in war-torn countries? And who secures the safe passages of the oil over the seas? So it is plain to see that the bourgeois state apparatus is one of the most important tools for big oil to conduct, to conduct their business. This is one aspect. The other one is that the plan from the International Energy Association calls for a boundless solidarity between states for the most integrated corporations of all nations. Because modern renewables need rare elements that needs to be allocated, big investments need to be taken in poor countries and grids from different regions need to be connected. But the imperialist clash over Ukraine shows us that this is not going to happen anytime soon. While Europe is restarting their coal-fired power plants to replace Russian gas, uh, the US is beating the war drums against China. So these are good times for crude oil and reliable, uncomplicated source of energy that powers tanks, missiles, and fighting jets. However, there exists the political fever dream that this war can be the start of a genuine green energy transition. For example, the leadership of Fridays for Future in Austria, they cut the chief for a long time trying to convince the government that climate change is bad for capital interests. Now they see the chance that this war at least starts the exit from Russian fossil fuels. Therefore, they are staunch war supporters. I quote them. It is the highest priority to break with fossil fuels and with our dependence on Russia. An EU-wide oil and gas embargo is our only chance to stop this war. The latest embarrassing and weak oil embargoes from Brussels are not enough. No matter how dreadful the embargo, the, oil, the war will always be more dreadful. Uh, quotation end. For some, this abrupt change of tone might be in a strong contrast to the earlier peace-loving pacifistic version of the Fridays for Future leadership in Austria. But as I say in German, after you said A, you must also say B. Once you decided that the bourgeois state and the capitalists are the only force that can save society, then you have to follow these gentlemen to the depths of barbarism. These people told us that it is unrealistic, utopic, and practical to propagate for workers' control as a lever over big oil. How fast things can change. In Germany, the biggest real estate group with thousands of housing units stated that it will cap the temperature of their tenants to save energy. The minister talks about rationing gas for industry. So the question is clearly posed, who should decide who gets the energy? Who should decide on how the means of production are used? The upcoming class escalations, for example, on the industrial front will give important hints to the working class in this regard. Last point, there is this argumentation that the working class should not fight for control over the means of production because this will only end in instability, chaos, suffering. But we see that the opposite is true. The crisis of capitalism produces instability and chaos. This is what sets the working class in motion uh, to counter this barbarism and put an end to this once and for all. Thank you. Uh, thank you, comrade uh, Lucas, for that uh, interesting intervention. Our next speaker will be speaking in Spanish. So I will now welcome comrade uh, Alessandro Giardello from the Italian section of the IMT. Niklas, no solo nos has, nos has explicado lo que fue el análisis de Lenin del imperialismo en 1916. Niklas not only explained to us uh, what uh, Lenin explained in imperialism uh, at the turn of the century, sino también ha aplicado ese análisis al contexto del capitalismo de hoy. But he also explained and applied that analysis in the context of capitalism today. 
También Niklas ha planteado una, una cuestión muy importante. Niklas has put forward a very important question. Que con el monopolio no desaparece la competencia. Competition does not disappear with uh, the rise of monopolies. Hubo una polémica. There was a polemic. Hubo una polémica en el partido bolchevique en 1919 entre Lenin y Bukhari. There was a debate within the Bolshevik party in 1917 between Lenin and Bukharin. Donde Lenin insistió sobre esa cuestión. Where Lenin in insisted on this question. Y dijo. And he said. Que en ninguna parte del mundo. In no part of the world. El capitalismo monopolista. Ha existido. Ne existirá. Sin que en muchos sectores. Siga existiendo la competencia. Uh, he explains that uh, monopolistic capitalism um, hasn't existed and never will exist without there being many sectors of the economy. El imperialismo acutiza las contradicciones del capitalismo. Imperialism sharpens the contradictions. Entrelaza la libre competencia con el monopolio. It interlinks free competition with monopoly. Ma no abroga el intercambio, el mercado, la competencia, las crisis. Uh, but it does not get rid of uh, the problems associated with exchange and crisis. Esto es lo mismo que explicó Marx en la miseria de la filosofía, lo que, de lo que habló Nicholas. This is what Marx explained in the poverty of philosophy, as uh, Nicholas quoted. Y es lo, el fenómeno que tenemos en frente a nosotros hoy mismo. And this is the phenomenon we have in front of us today. No existe un monopolio absoluto. There does not exist an absolute monopoly. Se pueden establecer precios de monopolio que duran tres o cuatro años. Trust, acuerdos. You can establish monopoly prices that last for three or four years uh, based Pero on agreement. Esos se van a but this equilibrium will always be broken. Y se nuevos and that a uh, new equilibrium is established. La situación del capitalismo mundial hoy en día. The situation of global capitalism today. Como ha explicado Niklas, es de una concentración del capital cien veces más profunda de la que existía al tiempo de Lenin. As Niklas explained, is uh, the concentration of capital hundred times uh, more intense than in Por Lenin's ejemplo, time. en el año 2021. For example, in, the, in 2021. El tamaño de fusiones y concentración del capital. The degree of uh, fusions, mergers, and concentrations of capital. Ha llegado al valor más alto de la historia. Uh, will reach the highest level in all of history. De 5,65 billones de dólares. 5.5 trillion dollars. Sobrepasando el récord del año 2007, cuando se llegó a fusiones por 4,55 billones. Exceeding the limit, the record set in 2007, when it, the mergers reached 4.5 trillion dollars. Esto quiere decir que en esta época turbulenta y después de la pandemia, el capital se concentra aún más. This means that in this turbulent period and after the pandemic, there is even more concentration. Está creciendo al mismo tiempo el papel de los estados. Uh, at the same time, we see an increase in the role of the state. A todos los niveles. At all levels. En Estados Unidos se está aprobando una ley por limitar in, las, las inversiones americanas en China. In the U.S., uh, a bill is being discussed to limit U.S. investment in China. En Italia, Francia. Alemania, Reino Unido, los estados están interviniendo para defender sus empresas. Uh, the U.S., Italy, France, the U.K. are all intervening in order to defend their businesses. Hasta el punto que se están haciendo nuevas nacionalizaciones burguesas. 
to the point where they're actually carrying out new bourgeois nationalizations. Hace 20 años, 20 years si ago, se miraba la lista de los, de los 500 empresas más grandes de, de, del mundo, la que publica look, Fortune. If you looked at the list of the global Fortune 500 companies, solo 27 empresas eran estatales. Only 27 of those companies were state owned. Ahora ha llegado al nivel de 110, 110. Today, that number is 110 state owned companies on the Fortune 500. Y en eso, el, la parte más importante la está jugando el capitalismo chino. And the, the largest share of this is uh, the role played by Chinese capitalism. Se está reduciendo la supuesta autonomía de los bancos centrales. Uh, the, the supposed uh, autonomy of the central banks is being questioned. El proteccionismo está creciendo a todos los niveles. Protectionism is growing at all levels. Y bien sabemos el, el efecto que tuvo el proteccionismo en los años 30. And we know the effect that protectionism had in the 30s. Que fue lo de transformar la recesión en una depresión profunda y una estagnación prolongada which transformed the recession into a prolonged uh, depression. La así llamada globalización ha empezado a eh, voltar atrás. So-called globalization has turned in reverse. Y todas las ilusiones reformistas, ilusiones no. neocautskianas, all the reformist illusions and neocautsky illusions, iba muy que iba muy de moda en los años 90 durante el movimiento contra la globalización. Which were really in fashion during the 90s and in the movement against globalization. Han sido destruidas por la realidad. Have been destroyed by reality. La ecuación se complica aún más por el papel que está jugando China. The uh, equation is complicated even more by the role that China is playing. Sobre el carácter capitalista e imperialista de China, hemos hablado varias veces. We've spoken many times about the capitalist and imperialist character of China. Y se publicó hace poco un documento de la corriente muy valioso. And we published recently a document by the Tendency, by the, by the International, that was very good. Quiero añadir solo algunas observaciones. I just want to add a few observations. Eh, en los últimos 40, 40 años, China ha desarrollado un sector privado que representa entre el 60 y el 70% del Producto Interior Bruto. A few years ago, uh, China had a private sector that was around 60% of the economy, of the GDP. Hasta 2015, todo el mundo pensaba que esta lógica del mercado privado seguiría prevaleciendo. Until 2015, everyone thought that that logic of the private market would continue to prevail. Pero estamos asistiendo a un retroceso. Y la empresa pública ha mostrado una clara recuperación. But instead, we're seeing a retreat. And the public uh, companies have uh, shown a clear uh, recovery. Pekín hizo um, planes de concentración de la de la economía pública. Beijing had plans for uh, concentration uh, in the uh, public sector. Una oleada de fusiones que permitió a la empresa china pública resistir al impacto de la apertura a los mercados internacionales. A wave of fusions and mergers that allowed Chinese industry to resist the impact of foreign capital entering the, the market. Y se están promulgando una serie de leyes para aumentar el control estatal sobre las empresas privadas en China. And a series of laws are now being discussed about uh, establishing increased controls over private industry in China. Hasta poner comisarios políticos del partido dentro de las empresas privadas. Even, even to the point of appointing political commissars in the private industries, in the, in the factories. Hay quien habla de una vuelta atrás, de una vuelta hacia un estado obrero deformado. Some people are talking about uh, 
turning back the wheel and going back to that there's a process of returning to Creo a esto no, state. Creo que esto no es el caso. I don't think this el is the case. Se ha en China. Capitalism has totally entrenched itself in China. Pero si nos estamos uh, enfrentando a, una, a un capitalismo de Estado muy peculiar. But we are faced with a very peculiar version of state capitalism. Y a un sistema bonapartista, bonapartista donde el poder de Xi Jinping está, se está concentrando en la mano de un, de, un solo, de un solo hombre. It's a Bonaparte system in which uh, Xi Jinping is concentrating all power in his own hands, in the hands of one man. Esto es una consecuencia de las dificultades que está pasando China. This is a consequence of the difficulties that China is passing through. Que ya no puede mantener las portentosas tasas de crecimiento que, que tuvo en el pasado. It can no longer maintain the uh, extreme rates of growth that it upheld for years in the past. Y se están un de problemas. And uh, a mountain of problems is accumulating. Con el problema de la deuda. With the problem of debt. Que ha el 300% del Producto Interior Bruto. Which has exceeded 300% of GDP. La burbuca especulativa en el sector inmobiliario. The speculative bubble in the real estate sector. El riesgo de una, de una creci, de un crecimiento importante de la inflación. And the risk of a sharp rise in inflation. El desempleo juvenil que ha llegado al 19,3%. And youth yeah. unemployment that has reached 19%. Y la dificultad de desarrollar un mercado interno sin acumular nuevas deudas. And the difficulty of developing an internal market without uh, increasing in, in the accumulated debt. Y al mismo tiempo, la actitud de Estados Unidos. At the same time, the attitude of the U.S. Y también, y también de la Unión Europea que ahora mismo considera a China un rival sistémico. And also the attitude of the European Union, which now considers China a systemic rival. Hay varios eslabones débiles que se están acumulando. There are a number of weak links that are accumulating. El elemento más interesante en esa época es que tenemos la crisis the, del the principal most imperialismo. The most interesting feature of this epoch is that we have the crisis of the first imperialist power. Que es Estados Unidos, que, que está pasando por una fase de declive prolongado which is the United States passing through a prolonged period of decline. Y al mismo tiempo no hay una nueva potencia que se puede imponer a nivel mundial. At the same time, there is no other power that can impose itself on a global scale. Esta es una condición ideal para el desarrollo de situaciones de fermento social hasta incluso de situaciones pre-revolucionarias. This is an ideal condition for giving rise to a social ferment and even for a pre-revolutionary uh, outburst. Lo hemos visto históricamente. We've seen it in history. La recesión que se está preparando. The crisis that's being prepared. El crecimiento de la inflación a nivel, a nivel mundial. The rise of inflation around the world. Representa un empuje muy, muy potente al desarrollo de luchas económicas. These are factors that are going to give a very powerful impulse to economic struggles. Lo hemos visto en todo el mundo. We've seen it around the entire world. El, el proletariado chino ha cambiado mucho en esos años. Se ha renovado mucho. The Chinese proletariat has changed a lot in recent years. It's uh, gone through a renovation. Hay un proletariado joven There's a que young se ha proletarizado desde hace poco. A freshly proletarianized layer. Cada año entran 10 millones de nuevos trabajadores dentro de la fábrica. 10 million new workers into the factories every year. Y ya hemos visto muchas luchas sindicales reprimidas already, por, por parte del Estado. We've already seen many uh, labor struggles that have been brutally repressed by the state. 
Y esto estoy absolutamente cierto, va a ser el eslabón más débil de la, del sistema chino. And I'm sure that this uh, represents the Achilles heel. This will be the, the weakest link of the Chinese system. La lucha de clase es la variable en este enfrentamiento que puede hacer saltar el banco. The class struggle is the key variable that can turn the tables uh, in the relation in this conflict. Y destruir todos los planes de la clase dominante. And destroy all the plans of the ruling class. El capitalismo nunca ha estado tan parasitario como hoy. Capitalism has never been as parasitic as it is today. Los estados están interviniendo por proteger los beneficios de una minoría de super ricos. States are intervening in order to protect the interests of the super rich. Que es una misión de la quiebra de ese sistema. Which is an admission of bankruptcy for the capitalist system. Nosotros queremos usarlo, el Estado, en beneficio de la mayoría. We want to use the state in the interest of the majority. El capitalismo ha socializado la economía, como se explicó en la ponencia. Capitalism has bueno, socialized the economy. Pero la apropiación queda privada. But there's still private appropriation. Por eso tenemos que expropiar los bancos, las grandes empresas, y ponerla bajo el control de los trabajadores. That's why we must expropriate the banks, the large companies, and put them under workers' control. Hemos entrado en una nueva época, compañeros. We've entered a new epoch, comrades. La época parasitaria del sistema capitalista. The parasitic epoch of capitalism. El sistema Está totalmente podrido. The system is completely rotten. Tenemos que construir la organización revolucionaria. We have to build a revolutionary organization. La internacional de los trabajadores. An international of the working class. El factor subjetivo. The subjective factor. Que pueda tumbar el sistema. That can y abrir el camino. System a una nueva sociedad. And open the road to a new society. El socialismo. Socialism. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Alessandro, for that uh, very interesting uh, intervention indeed. We will make uh, another attempt to bring in comrade Ivan Lu from uh, Russia. Okay, thanks comrade. A socialist economy is first and foremost a plant economy. But does this mean what's any plant economy is socialist. Capitalism is a chaos of competition, but in the age of imperialism, monopolies allow capitalism to go beyond its limits and plan ahead. The free market becomes the destiny of small and medium businesses. If so, what is the advantage of centralized socialist planning? To understand this, we must look to the historical experience of the Soviet Union. The path to the socialist economy lies in overcoming alienation on the one hand and the commodity economy on the other. Replacing the market with the plan today is rather a technical task than the social one. But as long as alienation exists, commoditism and thus elements of the market will reappear again and again in more and more ugly forms. This is exactly what we saw in the Soviet Union. Formerly, workers' wages were completely unified and depend only on qualification. But in fact, wages varied drastically from factory to factory, which led to the emergence of a labor market and competition between factories and between workers. Along with other forms of oppression, the October Revolution abolished the peace work wage system and equalized the wages of managers and skilled workers. Like nationalization, these measures were implemented under pressure from workers' councils and factory party organizations. The mobilization of advanced workers to the front, the food brigades, led to the depletion of the worker class and a drop in labor discipline. 
Under these conditions, the party leadership, including Lenin and Trotsky, looked upon peace work almost as a panacea. Already by 1921st, the peace work wage system exceeded 50%, despite the resistance of the workers' councils. Not surprisingly, with growth of inequality went hand in hand with a decline in the activity and role of the councils. The situation became even worse during the first five-year plan, when Stalin used Lenin's draft how to organize competition to fight wage leveling. The bureaucratic competition was destroying the plant system. At first, the competition was between workshops, but by the second five-year plan, a Stahanov movement was emerged, destroying worker solidarity in any phase or team. At a higher level, competition between plants and region forced bureaucrats to make decisions which maximized formal indicators, often at a cost of reduced production effectivity. These are uh, accompanied by embellishment and over-fulfillment of the plan. Then, figuratively speaking, more balls were produced than nuts to them. These led to overspending of raw materials and overgrowth of material reserves of enterprises. It was an absolutely typical situation where at one plant the production was paralyzed because of the equipment breakage, while the same equipment was in reserve and was not used at others. In its sense, socialist competition led to the emergence of bureaucratic competition between enterprises. But from the point of view, of the new generation of bureaucrats and liberal intellectuals, the problem was not in it, but in the absence of market. It did not take into account the negative experience of a new economic policy epoch. It sampled the works of Yuri Larin, which showed how the market led to corruption and embellishment in the public sector of the economy, were hidden from readers and spechran. The results was the collapse of the Soviet Union's economy. It's true what's economic inequality is inevitable under socialism, especially in a worker state, but this is only half of the truth. The other half is what inequality continually destroys the basis of the worker state, the solidarity and enthusiasm of the mass. This is why the worker state is inherently unstable. It's not a mixture of elements of capitalism and socialism, with their gradually changed ratios, but an immanent class struggle of these elements. But not only class contradictions, also inevitable other contradictions of the worker class with bureaucracy, realna, with its own state. Would you say workers' control? Was it not enough? Only a change of labor, a mass participation of workers in all levels of production and social management can overcome alienation. The current level of education of workers allows this. So, what is the basis of the socialist planning? It isn't a reasoning of intellectuals or the calculations of technocrats. It's the will at organization the worker class as a whole, which be becoming a class for itself, destroys itself as a class. We dialectically destroying its power, its state on the way to communism. Thanks, comrade. Uh, thank you, comrade, for uh, that excellent intervention. Now I will ask uh, Nicholas Abin Svensson from the International Secretariat to sum up the discussion. Thank you. This was a quite wide ranging discussion, which I think was very interesting. Uh, I won't have time to deal with all the questions that were raised. So I'm just gonna start at the end with um, Comrade Ivan's uh, intervention. And I think this is a very important point to uh, make that he made. Now, if we are, if we say that we are for a worker state, what does that mean? Is it a, a state for the workers that is, uh, you know, gives good things to workers, like a kind of uh, benign uh, 
uh, states that gives nice things to workers, like nice reforms. This is very much the conception of the Stalinists, which is very similar, incidentally, to the conception of the Social Democrats of what the state should be. But that's not what we mean when we talk about a worker state. It's a state by the workers for the workers. There is a state which in all levels are run by the workers themselves. And that means certain things, which I think uh, uh, Comrade Ivan went into in a little bit more detail. And uh, Comrade Francesco also touched on the point of workers' control and how uh, workers can take control of factories, even under capitalism, but without the generalized movement, without the workers take, actually taking power in the whole of the country and eventually the whole of the world, uh, if you don't take the power on, on a... Uh, on a wider scale, if you don't generalize the movement, then obviously you remain isolated and you will be destroyed. But the question of uh, raising the level of the working class, educating them and so on, is it, very important in this question, in this uh, aspect. Because of course, if you are to run a society, you need a certain degree of education. Some of parts of it is very complicated from a technical point of view. But thankfully, capitalism has helped us along quite a bit in this uh, regard. Even uh, in the advanced capitalist countries today, most workers have had even uh, not just a primary education, but also secondary education. And a great deal of workers have a high degree of numeracy as well as a high degree of literacy, uh, which are necessary for their jobs. A whole layer of management has become proletarianized and our administrators, which are running the companies on behalf of the capitalists. The clerks uh, used to be a like a privileged layer in a factory. But of course, there are still lots of layers of management which find themselves who, you know, sympathize much more than the cap with the capitalists and with the workers. But there are also big layers of uh, administration which is now would now uh, be on the side of the workers if there was a revolution. But our task, uh, particularly outside of the where uh, outside of the advanced capitalist countries, our task would still be to continue to raise the level and involve workers, in, uh, all workers in as far as possible in the productive, in the, in the running of, uh, of uh, production and in the running of a whole society. And that's also what, the point that Franco made in his intervention. Um, Lucas then spoke about uh, the question of the environment, of the climate change and so on. And it's, uh, it's amazing how illiterate the environmentalists can be sometimes when it comes to economic uh, economic questions or economic questions because uh, if we were to if 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 they continue to fight this uh, uh, you say war of sanctions with russia they are facing like <laughs> the industries of uh, western europe some of those industries will face a complete uh, disaster this winter when the gas runs out uh, because when you close down these industries, you can't restart them again, sometimes not even for years or sometimes not even for decades. So where would then be the industries to create the green energy that we want? And instead, as Lucas mentioned, uh, you have uh, a return to investment in coal, an increased investment in coal and oil instead. It's a very practical solution. These people are very fond of practical solution, and this is a very practical in inverted comma solution. In fact, the policy of these kind of environmentalists could be summarized as with just a few words. It's a shortcut over a steep cliff. Um, and obviously planning uh, on the basis of socialist planning would be able to resolve these problems, uh, not immediately, but over a period of time. Comrade Alessandro touched on a number of important points. One of the points is, uh, that he discussed was this question of that monopolies don't remain forever static. And it's just human society cannot simply stand still. It cannot just stop at the reach a certain point and then stop there. Just because uh, uh, capitalism reached, uh, outlived its historic role in 1914 or somewhere around there, doesn't mean that, the, that capitalism and the history stops until we have socialism. There's a constant process taking place, which is moving in one direction or another. And the same goes for monopolies. There's not a sta stasis which remains after a certain monopoly has been achieved. But in one way or another, these mono monopolies are broken up, not to reestablish a free 
competition, but to re-establish re a new constellation of monopolies. Yeah, so there's a constant, even the bourgeois economists even have worked out uh, certain formulas for, ha for how this happens, which my uh, secondary education showed, uh, education in economics showed me. Um, but uh, uh, anyway, these are constantly, uh, these are, these are uh, not just static for all time. And I think that's an important point. And uh, when, uh, because there are big profits to be made in these industries, and also sometimes they're of strategic importance for the whole of the capitalist class in a particular country to be, have their own industry of a particular kind. So at present and in the past period, we've had two companies in the world producing passenger aircraft. Um, that's Airbus and Boeing. One of them subsidized by the American taxpayer and then the other one by the European taxpayer. Now, of course, China as a rising power, they want their own air, air, airline. Air, uh, aircraft production because they don't want to be reliant on the industries of uh, France, Britain, United States and Germany. Also, of course, because there are certain interconnection between that and the military side of things, the military aircraft. So they are now investing a lot of money in trying to develop their own uh, aircraft aerospace industry. Just like because uh, Taiwan is threatened by China and therefore the US uh, uh, industries of all different kinds cannot rely on semiconductors coming from Taiwan. And therefore the United States is now spending uh, this uh, hundreds of billions of dollars in order to try to develop their own industries to compete with Taiwan semiconductors manufacturing company, which as it happens also in turn was uh, started off as the state subsidized enterprise. But there is something, I think the, the more, the most important question which is uh, being dealt with in this discussion and which is the, um, we say there's the red thread that runs through uh, Marxist and Lenin's uh, writings on this question is that conditions have, uh, have been created for a socialist society. It's not just an academic discussion about, uh, you know, what is the nature of share ownership and so on. It's not just an academic discussion. But Lenin and, and Marx studied this question because of its re relevance to the question of the productive forces. And because it showed that the conditions for socialism were already in existence when it came to Lenin and were developing when it, when it was what Marx found. That is, that conditions were ripe for the socialist revolution. And obviously, since, the, since Lenin wrote imperialism, another 105 years have passed, although 106 years have passed. And now conditions aren't just ripe, but they're rotten ripe. Really, capitalism should have been overthrown a century ago. It's beyond the scope of this discussion, but uh, why that wasn't the case, why it wasn't overthrown 100 years ago. But now we have another chance. And where things will go, if we don't succeed, I think we are quite aware of. It is abundantly clear that we're not going to go back to a 1950s-style welfare uh, capitalism in the advanced capitalist countries. And it's also clear that there's no way that the rest of the world is ever going to reach that point either. But the only way out is socialism or barbarism. So that's why we need to redouble our efforts to build the forces of Marxism and that's for those of you who have joined the IMT already. And for those of you who haven't joined, there's an excellent form on the website which you can fill in and get in touch with us.